You're listening to Comic Reflections, episode 75. I'm your host, Nicholas Prom. Today, uh, uh, it's going to be a bit different. Uh, Jeff is on a leave of absence. So, um, so we've got uh, some fill-in uh, from... Uh, well, long-time listeners will remember Spencer Valdez, my original co-host. Hey. And he has uh, graciously agreed to uh, fill in while uh, Jeff is away. I did. Yes. S- speak up, baby. Oh. Yes, I I did say I will yes. fill in for you. So welcome back, Spencer. Your 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 willing to su- willingness to sub is very appreciated. Yeah, no problem. And uh, Spencer's roommate and and our mutual pal uh, Sean is here. You might hey. might hear some snark chiming in uh, as uh, as we progress through today's show. Yeah. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, the first book we're going to talk about today is uh, first issue special number one. And uh, his first issue special was kind of a showcase book, but not really. It wasn't really a tryout book. Right. Um, it, I think it was just some odds and ends that kind of, I don't know, it's like a, uh, a, like a tryout book that they didn't try really hard. Right. But they did use uh, uh, some, some, a handful of uh, like uh, Jack Kirby concepts that uh, didn't get to uh, be their own series. And it's too bad because the ones they used were pretty fun. Uh-huh. Um, and this one, this is a Jack Kirby thing. It's uh, Atlas. Atlas the Great, um, written and drawn by Jack Kirby, and inked by D. Bruce Berry. Right. So, Spencer, what's going on? What, what, tell me about this story. Mm-hmm. So, like you said, it's a, kind of a first issue kind of uh, kind of story. So, we, we get a lot of background. Uh, Atlas is, uh, he kind of is a, like a paid fighter, or like a spectacle, kind of going, like, seem like a, going town to town, being like, oh, I'm a strong man. Yeah, challenge me and just wallops the competition. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he gets into trouble with like the local authorities. Yeah, some uh, some noble guy starts getting in his face, calling him a cheater, and just uh, just starts wanting to like drag his name through the mud, and he's not going to stand for it. And so he grabs him, knocks over his uh, um, kind of pedestal thing that. It's kind of thrown that. What is that crap that were... they carry, guys? It's like it's like a chair on sticks that people carry around. Yeah, it's yeah, one of those yeah. deals. Uh, knocks his uh, knocks him over. He's like, I don't take uh, crap from slavers. Yeah, uh, and so it starts dragging him through the streets, and he's yeah. like, "Here's your nobleman." Yeah. So so Atlas is a very rough and tumble kind of character, right? Um, he he's a very classical Superman in a in a very mi- in the the mythical kind of way. You know, Hercules is like this right, too. And, yeah. Um, this isn't like the necessarily the Atlas of myth, mm-hmm. but um, I don't know. His origin is mirrors Conan's quite a bit. His yeah. village was c- killed, slaughtered by bad people, and yeah. then he got away and grew up to be big and strong and kick ass. Right. Yeah. So it's basically that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and so we we do get that origin story within this uh, yeah. this issue, uh, and it it's interesting because it, he he decides. Oh, my new mission is to find these these people who killed my family and yeah. friends and yeah. neighbors, yeah, and kill them right back. Yeah, and <laughs> the the issue concludes with him like confronting some, like the head, the guy who, the boss of that nobleman right. that erupted up. The uh, the lizard human, the human lizard is I think what they called him. Uh, is he really that? He looks like a people. Yeah, he looks yeah. Uh, but, um, but he has a nice serpent head on his, um, on his helmet. Yeah. But I mean, if so it's re- it's liberally borrowing from Conan if you think about it. Right. If, if if you think about what a kid sees, right, and he's being held in like, yeah, uh, and is being hurt by something, you know, he's yeah. gonna pick up on what he sees, and he yeah. sees this snake thing on this right. guy's head. And so right. But a uh, couple of things. I mean, unlike Conan, Atlas is superhuman, super powerful. Right. And also, this does not get a resolution. And this is a one-shot. I mean, the, the yeah. last panel says, hey, if you would like to read more Atlas, write to us. Well, no more Atlas came. <laughs> right. Um, ye- decades later, Atlas kind of became a... Uh, showed up in Superman kind of in, in the few years before the New 52. Okay. As kind of an anti-hero. Like, yes, he's doing good... But he comes into conflict like, for Superman because Superman doesn't approve of his methods. This right. guy's like kind of a man out of time or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he just doesn't, you know, Superman's polite and into obeying the rules <laughs> yeah. of society. He's a Boy Scout. He is. And Atlas is definitely not. So he's 
He reminds me a bit of uh, Marvel's Hercules. Okay. Only her, the Prince of Power, a little more, uh, uh, less uncouth, I guess. Okay. I don't know. I, but but there there are definitely similarities between the two. Right. Uh, so one thing I I did like about uh, this, and I'm I'm sure it was in other. Uh, oh, there's like comments. a one page text piece. Yeah, the story behind the story. And isn't um, I believe it's Jack Kirby telling about his enjoyment of myth stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and where, you know, kind of where he wanted to go with this. Yeah. Uh, it it talks about how uh, the definition of legends has kind of changed. Uh, and that legends were typically uh, mythic gods, uh, some supernatural being, um, and and oh, yeah. today uh, our legends are you know Superman and how right, uh, but they all draw from the the classic Greco Roman myth structure and the Norse gods and all right, that stuff. Yeah, They're... and so Kirby would take from those and really plan out some of his. Uh, yeah, storylines using those legends. Yeah, I did take a look at this text piece again. It, Kirby didn't write the text piece, but but it's I think it's true to you know his uh, his method of coming up with with stories and, and ideas. Um, and and Jack Kirby was just like a wellspring of ideas. There was no shortage right. of stuff. And not only the greatest comic book artist who ever lived, but also one of the fastest. Right, yeah. You know, uh, so he's it, very prolific it talks in his, about that in his and long the, career. And the story behind the story and how uh, he might be fast, but uh, not even he can keep up with the demand of what everyone wants. And well, so, right. And, and so things like Atlas yeah. were probably pushed to the side because he had other... Right, and the thing is, so many, Kirby had so many great ideas, especially during his period at DC in the 70s. He really went wild... A lot of them didn't get to meet, reach their full potential because DC was being uh, the Carmine Infantino became the publisher in the seventies, and he really mismanaged a lot of things. Mm -hmm. He was he he was a weak leader. Uh, he was better just just just, just draw the Flash, Carmine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't don't be the publisher. Um, and so many of Kirby's really cool ideas kind of uh, got canceled or didn't uh, get to reach the potential they that they could have. Right. Um, and so in the late seventies, he went back to Marvel. Okay. Um, but um, that's there's more to that story, which I won't. I don't know if we have enough time for that today. But <laughs> um, our next book we do have uh, is um, another issue of first issue special. It's number four, and it's uh, Lady Cop Poisoned Love. Yeah. <laughs> uh. um, we, excuse me. It's uh, written by Robert Conagher. With art by John Rosenberger and inks by Vince Coletta. Now, Bob Conagher is one of the most prolific writers in comics. Thousands of stories okay. in his career. Um, but primarily, he was known for writing war comics. Sergeant Rock. Uh, the Unknown Soldiers. Things like that. So. So, uh, Lady Cop. Uh, a girl witnesses her roommate being murdered while she's hiding under the bed. Yeah, and then a lady... two roommates. Uh, I think there were two. Of oh, them. that's right. Yeah, and anyway, uh, a lady cop counsels her and you know asks her questions or whatever, and then she decides I'm going to be a lady cop and find my roommate's killers. Yeah, and so she goes to police academy and becomes a cop, and we see her her adventures throughout this. Yeah, it is awful, but great. I love this comic. I hated it with everything in me. Really? Yes. Was it just so much pain? It was. It was. Pain. Yeah. Right okay. in my stomach. Like, oh, why am I reading this still? Yeah, Lady Cop. What's her name? It's Liza, isn't it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, Liza. Hang on, hang on. Keep talking. I'm gonna find it. Right. So. Uh... Nelly. No. <laughs> Damn it, Sean. <laughs> she. She's. She's out on. You know. Uh, trying to find the guy who killed her roommates. Uh, but... Well, she says that, but she doesn't spend any right. time looking for him. No, nothing is done in the search Lies for... Liza Warner, by the way. Okay. Uh, yeah. in, in the search of this man. And so the her, as Lady Cop, really kicks off by her stopping... A rape. A rape. Hey, uh, right on. On a rooftop, no less. Right. Uh, th my issue with this is that... So she stops the rape. And then proceeds to talk to the guy about, hey, I'm a lady cop. 
And, well, one of them and, steals a kiss from her, too. Yeah, uh, uh, and then while she's talking it up, the his buddy jumps behind her, and another attempted rape occurs. Yeah, uh, but she seems uh, fine. <laughs> yeah, she's okay when she's like, oh, you rascals, get down those stairs to the cop car. Are well, you kidding me? Well, they didn't, like... She was able to overpower them and subdue them very quickly. She didn't experience any trauma there. Okay, I... Yeah, okay, I I did not I did not like this book. Okay, um, and one I one of the reasons I think <laughs> is okay. because it was written by a man s- thinking about what a woman would think. Yeah, about being a cop, and it is just yeah, it is just so bad. I will say I like I I. I did enjoy this. I realize it's flawed. Right. Uh, Bob Conagher, uh, how me put this? Had a reputation as he was respected for his work, mm-hmm. but not well liked by other comic book people. Not okay. a not a nice man, I the see. Bob Conagher. Okay. So, um, but yeah, Lady Cop, Liza Warner, she buys a little girl ice cream, and she. Uh, she counsels a girl who's got VD. Oh, yeah, with the VD thing. I was like, what the crap? Right? Yeah, and then her dad's gonna, like, the, the dad of the girl with VD is gonna hit her, and then... Oh, but then, good news, there's a scene of her in a bikini. Lady Cop has a boyfriend. This is... It's... it's We're playing up to... Remember, in the 70s, romance comics were still around. Right. Uh, DC, Marvel, and Charlton still put out romance books. And I think it's playing into that angle a little bit. Okay. So she's got a boyfriend. She's at the beach, like, and he's like, I can't marry a working woman, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Like, wow, sexism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is not exactly the women's libbers book that it could have been. Right. But I think it wanted to be. Yeah. And, like, uh, I wrote that. Do, do we, do they get points for effort? Or I trying? don't think so. I mean, it's, if, here's the thing. If it was, like, a, it's a black cop. But it's, like, kind of racist, but, like, not maliciously? Would it be the same thing? I don't think I would like it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you use blackface, you're still using blackface. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks, Sean. <laughs> my, the the thing I wrote at the bottom was, it seemed like... Of your notes. A, yeah, of my notes. Uh, it, it seemed like a book that, like, Hillary Clinton and Tipper Gore got together and commissioned a comic book to be written. And they were mm-hmm. like, be feminists. They were and, political non-entities in 1975, by the way. Okay. But yeah. Uh, they were like, write a comic book, man. It seems like one of those PSA comics. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever read, read PSA comics? They're usually crap. <laughs> and they actually, is, yeah, they're bad. This is what we get. So this is this feels PSA. like that to you, huh? Yes. Wow. I think it's a little better than that because those are usually really heavy-handed. And kind of like, this isn't a good comic. You didn't think that? So with this, look, ladies, you can do what a man can do. Of course women can do what men can do. You have to remember, 1975, um, people are still getting into that idea, okay? Yeah. And especially comic books, this is all, the whole creative team is men. It's a much, very much a boys club. Yeah. It's and different I, I now. And there were maybe a, a very few women working in comics in the classic periods, okay? So, I, eh. I'm i happy to be reading comics books now, yeah. because I feel like the evolution <laughs> of women has just been great. Yeah. You can have a female character, and she doesn't have to be the damsel, mm-hmm. or the lady cop, or, you know, so it, she yeah. can have a range of right. personality. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, I did want to mention, Liza Warner had, uh, didn't have any other appearances uh, for like 20 or 30 years, and then she showed up in Infinite Crisis, oh. and after that became a backup character in, I think, The Atom or Firestorm. Okay. Yeah. As? As Lady Cop. As Lady Cop. Okay. Not, I mean, the, no one was calling her that, it's right. Liza Warner, but... A- as a female cop. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, it's, I, yeah, so, so that's that. <laughs> right. So, so, moving on. Uh, let's look at Action Comics number three ninety seven. 
Uh, it's Superman in the 70s, and which is a dicey period. But this issue I, I did have fun with. I liked. It was fun. Um, the lead story is called The Secret of the Wheelchair Superman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Written by Leo Dorfman, who I usually hate as a writer. Usually okay. he's awful. I like this story, though. Um, with uh, art by Kurt Swan and, uh, and ink by Murphy Anderson. Mm -hmm. So kind of a classic team. People really like the Swanderson team. That, that's what they would call it. Um, but uh, I like it, but I prefer the Silver Age stuff with Kurt Swan and, and his classic inker, George Klein. Okay. Um, I like Murphy Anderson inking Carmine Infantino on uh, Adam Strange, and I like him as a penciler, but uh, he's not my favorite on Superman. Okay. Uh, so do a little... Plot. Yeah, we'll talk about this. Okay. Uh, so... um, it's, what is it, 1994? It's yeah. the 1990s, flash yes. forward, but Jimmy is still wearing uh, leisure suits and bell bottoms, <laughs> Jimmy Olsen. Yeah. I hear I'll just let you oh, go. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Jimmy's a hotshot producer. Of course. Uh, of Tele course. Television? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and he sees, a, he sees a guy, flips him a coin, you know. Like a beggar, right? Like a beggar, yeah. Guy in a wheelchair, dark uh, glasses. Guy leans, the, the coin bounces off his cup, guy leans over. Oh my goodness, it's Superman. Yeah, his, like... Uh, his, like, sweater falls off, the blanket he has falls off, and it, he's wearing his... It's his, his Superman, Superman costume. costume. So it's Superman in a wheelchair. Right. So, to me, it seems like, oh, I don't want attention, but I'm still gonna wear my Superman costume. Right. You know? uh, well, here's the thing, you're like, you have to, you have to imagine, somebody said, how about a story about Superman in a wheelchair? Write me a story. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so, and you have to do this, because... We we think of Superman like the all power he can do all power he can do all this stuff. Right. Well, why is Superman a cripple? What, what's going on? So here's the hook. So he's got to be wearing a super suit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so uh, a bunch of reporters and the public see him and he's like, oh, I gotta get out of here. They're like, Superman, I thought he was dead. He like yeah. disappeared years ago. Yeah. So uh, he takes off. He still has. Uh, it, it talks about him not having his powers a little bit, but he still has a couple remaining. So his. Uh, like X-ray vision and his heat vision, are and he still... kind of gets away in the wheelchair kind of quickly. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So he's lost his powers or yeah. something. And so he gets away, um, and he he makes it home, and someone knocks at his door, and he's like, "Oh, I got away, good." But someone knocks at the door, and it's Jimmy Olsen, and he's like, "Oh, someone found me," and instead of saying, "I should keep quiet." And they'll leave me alone. He says, come in. Right. Again, kind of attention-seeking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Leo Dorfman, not a great writer, but... Um, and it's Jimmy. Of course, yeah. Uh, and Jimmy's like, Soups, what's going on? Baby. Uh, <laughs> and, and so Superman tells him this story about how uh, over the last decade or so, uh, with all the new inventions... Yeah. There's been no need for Superman. And he gradually felt like, oh, my super feats are not needed to save people from, like, sinking ships and, like, different yeah, things. And, and, and so he comes in contact with this uh, environmental group that uh, is turning pollution into usable fertilizer. Right. And kind of turned the sun red, which we know zaps him of his powers. But... But... Here it was all in his mind. He yeah. was losing confidence in himself, feeling unneeded. Yeah. And so he had psychosomatic symptoms that made him think yes. he really didn't have his powers. And that isn't that's the part of the story that really caught me. I was like, yes. It's seventies pop psychology. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I thought I thought that theme was great. So he's living um, with these two people who have diseases or yeah, something. Like a mix between leprosy and Ebola or some some weird thing like I don't that. Oh it was Ebola, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and so... It's a made-up disease. Yeah. Uh, and so he's hanging out with them. But they were, like, they got sick because they were trying to come up with a cure for something sucky. So, yeah. like, they were being great people. Yeah. Uh, and so, Superman being the attention seeker that he is, he lives with these people and kind of takes care of them. He goes out and begs for them. Yeah. Um, and then at one point, I, I think it was in here, he kind of regrets the, I gave so much to charity... You know, and I've right. got nothing. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Uh, if only I still had my powers, I could just crush coal into diamonds. Yeah, totally. Which, by the way, do you know the diamonds are, like, really worthless? That they that just uh, De Beers 
you know, has a monopoly on these diamond mines and they just artificially inflate the price by controlling the supply. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's a ter ter terrible, terrible thing. Someday I am going to have to draw, like, <laughs> at least $1,500 on something that's worthless. Yeah. At least $1,500. Yes. Uh, I would like to say that my wife's wedding ring is beautiful and I love her. And She's she not going to listen to this show. <laughs> you can stop kissing up. She doesn't listen to this. Does she? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's be, be real. She's like, that's stupid. Yeah. Okay. Like, so, uh, my... So he, he goes to this doctor. Jimmy takes him to the doctor. He's like, you listen to your soups. We're going. And you can't say anything about it. And Superman can't do anything because he's, he's all weak. So he takes him to this doctor. And the doctor's like, well, you told me the story. It's because you think you can't do these things. But actually, you can. Right. And so the house where he lives with the diseased <laughs> folks catches fire. Yeah. And because it's like some, like, crap piece of part of town the firefighters don't show up or something they're, oh well they do they're but they're like oh we'll set this perimeter and the fire won't go past it but this place can go down it's yeah being so superman anyways. realizing he has he's the only one that can save them gets off his lazy ass and helps everyone yeah. helps the people out so he has his powers because he never really lost them right and saves those people and they die anyway yeah and he builds a memorial for them underground or something so, so their disease doesn't get out <laughs> right um and i think that was it right yeah and it's a whole like man isn't like our modern world neat we can be superman too like some like wah, wah, yeah, wah, wah, uh, crap you know yeah it it, it kind of was like it, it reminded me of um uh i say this about so much stuff but jurassic park uh where oh, man. jeff goldblum says we have the ability to do it but we never stop and ask should we um, right. And so, like, they have all these abilities. They have all these uh, um, machines and things like that. Yeah. But you lose something right. when you completely depend upon machines and technology. Right. Um, and so I think it ended up working, this story, a little bit. Yeah. No, I did and, enjoy and it. it. It's ridiculous, but... Yeah. But it was... I liked it. Well, okay. <clears throat> Hooray. Um, uh, so there's a backup story. Mm -hmm. And it's called The Super Captive of the Sea, uh, <laughs> written by Jeff Brown, with uh, art by uh, Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson. Mm -hmm. So w what happens in this story? I kind of don't remember. Right. So uh, Superman is uh, kind of doing his thing as Superman. Oh, I remember now. But uh, then this, this cloud of the space cloud shows up. Oh, man. And space kind of, clouds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, engulfs the earth, mm -hmm. uh, blocks him from it, uh, from the the light of the sun. Which right, gives him his power, uh, and it kind of it doesn't take away his powers, but it messes with them. So he can't fly in a straight line. He can't. Right. So he starts doing everything he can, like from underwater. Yeah. He he causes the uh, they call it a tidal wave. Right. But I'm pretty sure it's a rogue wave that puts out a fire on the coast. Okay. Uh, he, uh, from underwater, he uses his heat vision to, um, to weld a crack in a bridge. Okay. Uh, and he, so he's doing all this, uh, uh, stuff, uh, but he has to stay underwater. Right. Where his powers will work effectively. Right. But it turns out this uh, these aliens, were they wanting to conquer? They, they, they were wanting to take him from... That's right, Earth, from Earth to and, do super feats on their planet. Yeah. And so they were testing him yeah. by doing... Because they were an aquatic race, right? Yes. So by getting him to do this stuff underwater. Mm -hmm. So does he fight them? Once he, he uh, gets wind they, of their, what they're doing, right? Right, so uh, he keeps seeing these shadows of, like, humanoid. And when he finds them, oh, they're animals. Okay, okay. oh, sea turtle. It was a man. Yeah. Was, you know. But it turns uh, out they're shape-shifting aliens. Yes. Uh, and so they, so they were tricky. They capture him yeah. with uh, this net that kind of... Um, it was that like red solar radiation or something? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's made of the same material as the cloud. Something yeah. like that. And uh, and so Superman's trapped. And uh, so he's like, oh, so you can shapeshift, huh? Could Can you become a seahorse? Oh, yeah, of course. And so the little seahorse, he's like, oh, come here so I can see you better. So he comes close. He's like, oh... I bet you can't become a whale. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can. And so he becomes a whale inside the net. And it stresses out so Superman can get out. Yeah. Pretty dumb trick that, like, 
any no one would fall for. <laughs> right. Um, right. Uh, and so um, <laughs> he he was hoping. So Supergirl was out on a mission. Right. Outside of Earth. So she comes back and she can't get through this cloud. Oh, I forgot Supergirl was in this story. Right, and so she's just hanging out. Yeah. Somewhere. Um, and so he breaks free. He uh, he uses his freeze breath. on yeah. them, Freezes them in, in the water. And he's like, oh, they'll be okay. I know that aquatic animals... Once they're thought out, well, they're in suspended animation. And... Like that's not true at all. <laughs> right. I don't think that's true. It's not true. And he so he freezes them in the freeze breath <laughs> and in the, throws so them into the space. Planet. Yeah, and I'm like, there's some holes here. <laughs> so not the biggest hole in the story. Um, so he gets up and he <laughs> uh, he gets above the cloud. Yeah. Uh, and he decides, oh, I'm going to. Cause a whirlwind, and in space, and suck the 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 pink cloud into space. The problem is, space is a vacuum. You can't do that. Right. Uh, I mean, you could create force. I mean, because rock spaceships they use their rockets in space, right? Right. right? Yeah. Okay. But spinning around in circles not going to do anything. Well... The the second. Or maybe is, he could do it really well because of the weightlessness and there's stuff. No, there's no medium to create this vortex. Of the world. Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you, Sean. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just asking. Okay, you don't you need to come down on me about this. Jeez. The, the second issue I have. Put the gun this. away, Sean. I don't have a gun. Okay. Uh, the second <laughs> issue is oh why God. didn't Supergirl just do this? Because nobody wants Supergirl to save Superman. That's lame. I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, maybe if that's she's why. Just hanging out, not doing anything. Why did they bring in the story at all? Right. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> the, my third issue: Where are the super friends? The Justice League. Yes. Why can not they figure something out? Yeah, uh, like you to, would think that they would see the cloud was around. Yeah, yeah the entire Earth is engulfed. In I this mean, cloud. okay, you're using Supergirl, so obviously you're trying to make reference to that shared universe, right? Uh, yeah, the League has nowhere to be... It's... You know why? Because they can't have it be Superman's book and then have the League save his butt. I, I'm i just... I just think... I don't know. The, those are pretty big holes in this story, Nicholas. Okay, dude, and... I'm agreeing with you. I'm just... We're just talking, man. It Jeez. is your fault. It's my fault? It is your fault. It's my fault because that story didn't hold up water. Okay. You shouldn't have written it. I didn't write it. Um... <laughs> Anyways, it was silly, and it was fun. Oh my gosh! So, you think this is this really felt like a lot of the the oddball things that they would do in the Silver Age, uh-huh. which are the most hilarious and awesome stories to right. Superman to read. Like I, I laugh out loud and I love the stories, uh-huh. and yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, the next issue we've got to talk about is Amazing Spider-Man number eighty-five. Mm-hmm. And the story is The Secret of the Schemer, written yeah. by Stan Lee, with art by John Romita, John Buscema, and Jim Mooney. Really split up the art chores yeah, kind of, quite a bit on that book, but all greats. Um, and this is like the second or third part of a right, two or I three think, part story. I think this is kind of the, the, the conclusion. The conclu- yeah. So there's this guy, the Schemer, <clears throat> and he's seems like a supervillain, but he's causing trouble for the Kingpin. Yeah. So he's kind of an anti-hero. Uh, but also a villain. Yeah. Because he was trying to take over, uh, from what I understand from reading this. He wanted to stick it to the Kingpin. Right, he take... wanted to take over the Kingpin. Empire. Em- criminal Empire. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, him and the Kingpin are, uh, kind of. At odds. At odds, and they're in the Kingpin's, uh, penthouse. Yeah. And, um,. Superman shows up and Spider Man. Spider Man shows up. Wow, Superman's and, in this book. Yeah, it's crazy. He's everywhere. Wow. <laughs> he can't escape alien fish, but <laughs> um, oh man. Spider Man shows up and s- stuff goes down, and the schemer escapes the kingpin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we we kind of find out that uh, the kingpin's wife 
helped yeah. him escape. Vanessa. Right. And what is the relationship between the schemer and Vanessa? We don't know. Right. The kingpin thinks, is she cheating on me? Right. Uh, and so Spidey decides, well, you got away, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Spider-Man just happens to, like, be in the story. He doesn't really, yeah. uh, it's not, this isn't really about him. Right. Clearly. Uh, so, Gwen and her father show up. Oh, yes, uh, Captain Stacy. Right. At and, Peter's apartment. Yeah. Oh, this is great. This is yeah. a great subplot. Go and ahead. And so, uh, Gwen is like, you don't have to ask him your questions every time we see him, okay? Like, yeah. He's my boyfriend. Leave him alone. Right. You know, and he's like, nope, ah, he's Spider-Man. I'm going to catch him. You right. Know, every, you know. Sure. Uh, but Captain Spade, Stacy likes Peter. Yeah, yeah, but he also wouldn't mind catching him yeah. as Spider-Man. You know, when he died, it was revealed he, he knew he oh, was. Oh, yeah. He, he knew, yeah. like, so. But anyway. And so, uh, it, excuse me, so Peter... Is like, oh, hey guys, what are you doing here? Oh, my dad just has some questions for you. Okay. And, oh, perfect timing. My pictures are ready. I have to go get them out of the chemicals. Right. Oh, don't let us keep you. Yeah. As we're asking you questions uh, about you and Spider-Man. And then Sp then he goes out the window, and as Spider-Man comes in the other window. Yeah. And, like, it's kind of being a money. jerk. Yeah. Yeah. So he makes it think, like, he's got to deal with Parker for the photos. Right. And... So he's kind of makes Gwen think Spider-Man's a jerk. Yeah. So that he can kind of protect his secret identity. Right. It, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, back to Kingpin. Um, he's seeing pictures of uh, what happened in the penthouse in the paper now. Yeah. And he's like, ah, oh, and he sees a picture of Vanessa helping the schemer. Right. And he gets furious. And so he confronts her. Uh, and uh, while that is happening... The schemer wrecks his car. His own car. His own car. And he's got, like, kind of goofy gadgets and stuff with his yeah. car. It's kind of uh, like... It's booby-trapped, so when uh, He's such Spidey... a... He's, he's, he's very... He's mining a lot of, like, ridiculous supervillain tropes. Uh-huh. He's kind of got that, that Bond gadgety car. Yeah. 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 Uh, he has, like, razor blades <laughs> sewn into his cape. Yeah. Uh, things like that. But um, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so... Peter again confronts him. They have a little fight, and uh, uh, Spidey gets blown up a little bit. Um, and Schemer gets away. And so uh, the Kingpin's confronting Vanessa about who is this guy and where are you helping him. Right. And then when the Schemer shows up and he gives a flashback, he's talking about Kingpin's son. Right. The Kingpin's getting pissed. How dare you talk about my son? Yes. Who's dead. Yes. But. Uh, but. His son wasn't dead. This is Richard Fisk. Yes. He say pulls off the rubber mask a la Mission Impossible. <laughs> yep. And it's his young... The schemer looks like an old guy with the mask and right. the silvery you know, streaks in his hair. But really, he's a young guy. And he wanted to stick it to the kingpin because he found out his father was a criminal. He was ashamed and yeah. stuff. And then, so he disappeared on purpose. Yeah. And this is him resurfacing. And so the, the reveal sends the kingpin into shock. Yeah. And so it's just like catatonic. Right. Uh, and Spidey's like, well... See you later. I'm get out of here. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, you know? is he gonna bust him? Like, yeah. but you know, uh, uh, maybe our paths will cross again. Maybe they won't. Yeah. Somehow, it doesn't seem to matter anymore. Yeah. Like, okay, B or Spidey, you 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 get the last word here. Of course, it's but his not, book. Not because you won. But no because, one won. Right. You know, so, so. It, it's an interesting issue. I think it's, I think it's a good comic book. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring up a, a thing that was really big during the these comics. The the idea of keeping your secret identity a secret. Okay. It's 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 something that we when you read comic books from today, they they deal with, but not as much. But not in the way that like he has to climb out the window as Spider Man and come back in and it's it's a little it's a bit too sitcom. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what... And I think we're moving to an era where the secret identity is kind of like, come on. Right. Unless you're Batman or Superman, nobody really... Who else has the energy or the resources to really maintain that? Right. Everybody else is just like, okay, yeah, I'm so-and-so. Mm -hmm. You know? And so even with uh, uh, the new uh, Daredevil, 
that came out this last Wednesday. Yeah, I haven't read it yet, the new number one. Well, we know that his identity has been revealed. Yeah, he gave it up to kind of, you know, uh, 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 prevent the Sons of the Serpent from blackmailing or whatever. I think that's a good turning point for us in comic books. Yeah, and, you know, you have to look, like, in the movies have really changed it. Because look at the Marvel movies, Mm -hmm. the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They've really said, let's not do the secret identity thing. Right. Tony Stark is like, I'm public at the end of the first movie. Right. Uh, Captain America, people know who Steve Rogers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thor, they did away with the Don Blake alter ego. He's just Thor. Right. Um, people know that Banner is the Hulk. Mm-hmm. So they, we don't have this. Right. You know? It, it's it's something that uh, if Marvel tried to deal with that in their movies, they would lose me as part of their audience. You know what? I think one of the weak things, I think it's either Superman 3 or 4... I think it's number four, uh, when he's, there's some really lame sitcom-y situations where he's, like, out the window and back and forth right. as Superman and Clark, and it's just like, we could have had Brainiac. Yeah. You know, like, what the crap are you dealing with this, you know? Um, so, yeah, yeah it, it's good that they just not Yeah, uh, and I mean, during this time, it was probably really great. Uh, during the time uh, that this was written. But there's a time for these things to kind of go away. Right. I mean, and I think we're in that time, and I think it's great. Um, and you know, you know, there's the real-life superhero movement out there. You, you know about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. And those guys, like... Like, there's the, the... One of the most famous ones is Phoenix Jones, and I've talked about him before on the show. Uh, yeah, he got... Busted by the cops and his identity revealed. Right. So he no secret identity anymore. Right. Um, and that's kind of the way you would you would not be able to maintain it very long. Right. The higher your profile raise as a as a figure, mm-hmm. you, the the more chance of keeping that secret is you know nil. Right. It just disappears. So the secret identity I think is is something that's going to go away. Right. Especially if you don't have powers or like a bunch of money. Right. The, the the thing that I think keeps it going well with Batman is that his real identity is Batman. Right. And that Bruce Wayne is the mask. Right. Um, and Again, but he's got all the money and resources to right. like to keep up the front. Right. And Clark Kent can do or Superman can do it because he's Superman mm-hmm. and he can do anything, basically. Right. <laughs> um so uh, but but I think with Batman, yeah, uh, I think his life, I think his real, obviously his real life is Batman. Yeah, uh, and um, if he lost Bruce Wayne, he'd still be okay with being Batman. Yeah, if, uh, if... I don't think Peter Parker, if he lost, Pete, like shoot Spider Man. Yeah, he like being Peter Parker, he would hate himself. Right. Uh, he he's he's kind of a, a wimp. Right. He's kind of he, he's nothing special. He takes okay pictures. Yeah. But it, he would lose so much more than I think Batman would ever lose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, well, the next issue we've got to talk about it's a little odd for to just throw this in there. It's Amethyst, Pr- Amethyst Princess of Gem World number right. eight. Of 12. It's from that 12-issue Maxi series. Right. In the 80s. And uh, this, this story is called First Light. It's written by Don Mishkin and Gary Cohn, with art by the fantastic Ernie Callan, mm-hmm. uh, who is you know, famous for... Uh, I'm going to draw a blank. He's done some Legion of Superhero stuff. He did uh, Arax, Son of Thunder. Right. But the bulk of his career, he spent doing Richie Rich. And Casper the Friendly Ghost okay. at Harvey Comics. Uh-huh. Um, and he did uh, a couple few issues of uh, Dr. Solar, Man of the Atom, in the Silver Age. Okay. But, um, but yeah, terrific artist. But Yeah, Amethyst... it, was, it was great. I, I liked looking at it. Yes. <laughs> what, do you, what do you want to say about Amethyst? Uh, it's not a book I would pick up. Okay. Um, Why? I mean, I, I... So, okay, like like you said, it was... Like I said? Eight. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Of 14? 12. 12. It's like two-thirds into, like, kind of a, a, a semi-epic. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, and so we have the these beings, the Emissary of Varn, uh, 
mm-hmm. coming in and destroying certain aspects, certain uh, things in the gem world. Yeah. Let me back up a little bit. Gem world is, okay, Amethyst is, it's the typical 80s trope of normal kid goes to magical land and is the savior of that magical right. place. It's the labyrinth. It's a never-ending story. Um, you said it reminded you of He-Man and She-Ra. Right. And that's in there, too. I mean, it's sword and sorcery and it's lots of other fantasy elements, too. Um, it's such an 80s kind of thing. Um, I think it's cool. It's it's ambitious. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very high concept. It's hard to come in on a... Hello, eight issues in right. and get what the heck's going on. Yeah. But um, it's especially with magic stuff, you, if that's the hardest because it's all like right. there's no rules or like, you know, how it all works because it's yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, maybe I would I dig it if I read it from start to finish. Yeah. Um, I think it was kinda uh, cool, but But I mean, so these these emissaries are coming in and destroying different areas of gem world so like yeah. the diamond priests yeah. were destroyed and yeah uh it's all and amethyst she's a kid in in on earth one i think i think she's uh-huh. from earth one uh and then uh she goes to gem world and she's an adult and she's this babe right with powers and stuff yeah so if you remember in crisis on infinite earth she was blinded remember yeah yeah, I think she may blinded or died in fighting with like the shadow demons mm-hmm. from the anti monitor. But yeah, yeah. But then she had a pro- a post crisis reboot. She had another limited series, and I don't know if it got picked up as an ongoing again. Right. But pre crisis, she had this maxi series, and then an ongoing that ran uh, well until crisis. Right. Um. But because this is like 1983, so um. Notable book. I really, I love Ernie Callan's art, mm. uh, but it's hard for me to assess this just from this one issue. Right. And, I mean, from this issue, there seemed like there was some evolution in the female charactership. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to Lady Cop. We've come a long way from, 80, <laughs> from Lady Cop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, we want to move on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So... The next book we've got is Blackhawk, number 248. Right. Um, now, Blackhawk ran... Let me just give you a little background yeah. on the... Well, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the... Let me give the credits for this issue, and then I'll go back okay. to some background on this. Um, the story is, Vengeance is Mine, Saith the Cyborg. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, written by David Anthony Kraft, with art by Jim Sherman and George Evans. Um... Now, okay, the Blackhawks started out... First of all, Blackhawk was not originally a DC comic property. In the Golden Age, the Blackhawk was published by Quality Comics okay. and was co-created by Will Eisner, oh. who, you know, created the spirit. Right. And, um, and Quality Comics also had uh, Plastic Man and they had Uncle Sam and, uh, okay. and Doll Man and the Black Condor and the Ray, you know, the Freedom Fighters mm-hmm. and the Human Bomb. Um, when Quality Comics folded, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, DC acquired the rights to those characters and they published them at DC, you know, yeah. so, so they got woven into the DCU. And, uh, but anyway, Blackhawks, um, they started out, it was, it was a standard, it was a war book. It was a, a and, uh, Blackhawk being the leader and then mm-hmm. the Blackhawks being his like other uh, pilot friends, and they were an international team of pilots. They were not part of like a, the U.S. Army or anybody's thing. They were on their own and fighting uh, for the side of the Allies against uh, okay. the Nazis and against the Japs. We can say Jap in historical context. We're not <laughs> deriding them. We're talking right. about the enemies back in the 40s, okay? Right. So, okay. So, and uh, they had like a, a French guy, a Swedish guy, you know, an American. Mm-hmm. Uh, Black Hawk was... Polish, I believe, um, but I think that they once the world, world our, the U.S. entered into World War II, mm-hmm. they kind of retconned it and made him the American named Bart Hawk. Oh, okay. But then post crisis, they got another reboot and they kind of changed it back to the the Polish thing, um, and and one of the team members was uh, 
there's like eight guys, I think. Okay. And one of them was Chop Chop, who was a Chinese cook. And the original, the Golden Age version of him, he was like, he wore the, the, the mumu or like the night shirt, you know, okay. Bow in his hair, big buck teeth, mm -hmm. spoke like, oh, honorable Black Hawk, Black Hawk and, you know, right. really bad, okay? Oh, really offensive. He, yeah, <laughs> he even had solo backup stories, too, back oh. then. Um, but, which I'm sure, yeah, they're atrocious. Right. <laughs> um, when DC started using Black Hawk in the Silver Age, they kind of cleaned up Chop Chop. That's good. <laughs> um, and in, at this point, they even called him, he's Chopper, and he's got a standard, you know, Black Hawks uniform. He's part of the team. He's not just their sidekick. Uh -huh. um, but the Silver Age is really interesting because, okay, World War II is over. Mm -hmm. So they're they're telling new stories set in World War II, but also uh, the lead stories in the, in, in the title at that point would be um, Black Hawk as a, a team of adventurers and they're you know, they're fighting supervillains and monsters and science fiction-y kinds of things as well. Right. So it's an interesting title in then, and it's continued in that way into the 70s. And this is a couple issues before the book was canceled. Okay. Um, there's like two more issues after this, so it ran 250 issues, and then it was picked up again in the early 80s They and continued the original numbering. Okay. But it's funny, in the Silver Age, DC had uh, seemed to have a fondness for, like, uh, these non-superpowered adventure teams, adventurer teams, that would fight villains and fight aliens and science fiction-y kinds of stuff. They had the Sea Devils who operated in the sea, okay? Right. Um, and they also had the Challenges of the Unknown who operated everywhere. Right. And uh, that was created by Jack Kirby. Oh. In the, in the late 50s. Right. And Jack Kirby and Wally Wood. <laughs> that's, that's quite a team. But... Um, and that, that ran for, uh, I think, m much of the Silver Age. Um, so that, that's a really cool book, The, the Challenges of Challenges. the Unknown. Yeah. So, so, yeah, DC was into doing that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And then they, they're continuing that with Black Hawk. Right. So it's, I can't remember what year, it's, uh, it's 1976. The, it's, a couple, it's one of the last issues of the series. Right. And the Black Hawk team are up against BioLord. He's Bio a cyborg. Lord. He's an eco-terrorist. He's going to yeah. save the Earth. From mankind. Yeah. And, like, the the major governments of the world have kind of, like, put him together to see what he could do. And then it turns out the only thing that he could do is he, he kind to of, save the world he is go, to kill. He man. goes against the no, the good intentions of the mm -hmm. these world coalitions to, to, like, save the world. And yeah. he's going to uh, kill humans. So it's, it's very like the Terminator. Kind of yeah. like Skynet. Yeah. And here's the thing, you know, Terminator ripped off a story by... Harlan Ellison. Oh. And he, like, sued the uh, Fox or whoever. I think it was 20th Century Fox who put that out. And so at the end, they're like, special thanks to Harlan Ellison, you know, to oh. kind of make up for it. Right. I don't know when he wrote that story. I don't remember what it's called. But I wonder if this is borrowing from that directly from Ellison. Right, yeah. Uh, because, I mean, these are Terminators. Like, if you look at them, they look... Yeah, like... BioLord also has, like, these uh, battle droids that... Yeah, sorry. Or whatever yeah. they're called, but they they help fight against the Blackhawk team. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll let you just go. Yeah. Go. So uh, Blackhawk is running to. It starts off with Blackhawk running to try to stop this uh, million megaton bomb. Wow. Yeah. That uh, Bio Lord has has made. Yeah, he's going to destroy England. Yeah. He's going to nuke England because you know they're the worst. I guess. Uh. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. Uh, if you're going to nuke something, isn't that a horrible biological disaster? Absolutely. See, if it was a neutron bomb, I would get it because cause, yeah. cause it just kills, like, people and stuff. It's not, like, radioactive. Mm -hmm. You can do, you detonate a neutron bomb and it just kills everything. Uh -huh. But then, like, the plants and animals will come back and stuff. Right. But, no, he wants just death. Yeah, right. so it... Pretty illogical for a robot. Right. <laughs> uh... I mean, if, if, if his... Goal is to save the Earth from people, mm -hmm. not just destroy humanity. Right. So. Uh, but Blackhawk fails and falls off the rocket. Uh huh. But does these incredible backflips. Yeah. And lands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but good news. Okay. Um. Oh, who was it? 
uh, I think Chopper and I think uh, Chuck. Uh, Chuck, yeah, and he, he grabbed the uh, guidance system and changed it, and so it's gonna detonate somewhere else. Oh, so <laughs> this huge nuke is gonna <laughs> not England though. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe it'll uh, blow up out at sea. I don't know. Hopefully. I can't remember. Yeah. But the the million megaton bomb. That's pretty huge. Yeah. Uh, and so this angers Biolord, and he sends his metadroids. Metadroids, thank you. To fight the Blackhawks. And then there's the a big Hawks. fight. They do this cliche thing, like, to keep a battle short. They say, the battle is savage but brief. And I'm like, I have seen that so many times when they just don't want to do an extended <laughs> choreographed fight scene. Right. Uh, uh, and it's lame because you want to see a big fight, right? I mean, there's plenty of action in this comic, but so he's 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 sending his meta droids. Uh -huh. but at the same time, he takes a pause to tell them his origin story. Yeah, which we kind of relate already, right? Uh, and so they start. He's fighting. monologuing. Yes. Yeah. Monologuing <laughs> while the Blackhawks fight the uh, meta droids, and it's not going well. And then uh, the last one standing is Blackhawk. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's about to die. And then, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Duchess Fatale. Okay, who I don't really know. I think she's introduced late in the series, mm -hmm. and I'm just not familiar with her. And uh, a couple, and her, it says, and her girls. Yeah, this so this chick adventurer, and she's got a team of chick adventurers. Yeah. So, and, um, but I don't know much about them. Right, and then another Blackhawk shows up, and they take out the droids fairly simply compared to the rest of the team that fought the Blackhawk. Right, uh, the droids. Right. Uh, they think they kill the Bio Lord, uh, but he has a backup system. His brain escapes his body and then goes into another body. Right, and so which he, is typical of robot villains. Right. They they take off. He goes after him. He. Uh, uh, takes out one of their planes. And doesn't Blackhawk, like, parachute out and then, like, fight him directly? Yeah, he, he, he jumps out of the plane, jumps onto uh, Biolord, and, like, breaks his arm and makes him shoot himself. Isn't he made of metal? How did he just break a robot's arm? But anyway, okay. Anyway, uh, and so Biolord is gone. But uh, the kind of spoiler yeah, or the 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 cliffhanger is oh blackhawk is out of oxygen or something yeah, or blackhawk is dead yeah but two more issues no he's not right. dead <laughs> so uh, yeah spoiler he doesn't die interesting book yeah um, um robots are always fun yeah i mean this is late in the series i've read it earlier stuff like the silver age blackhawk stuff even some golden age stuff uh -huh. and those are really fun yeah so and so if you if you if you know you're kind of winding down you don't want to I mean, you do kind of want to go out on the bank, but yeah, and they and they ended resolution. it and they ended it kind of around a, a, a good number. It didn't. It's not an odd number. They ended it two hundred fifty issues. Okay. So it's like okay, that's yeah. Like they kind of like we're gonna cancel it, but do a cool story and kind of wrap it up. Right. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, and then again, in I think uh, the early eighties, eighty two, three, somewhere like that, mm -hmm. they brought it back and it started with two fifty one. Okay. So. Uh, and then I think it was back to World War II. Oh, nice. <laughs> so interesting, but I think. I haven't read those. But but anyway, so that's Blackhawk, at least for now. Um, one more one more issue yeah. for today. We've got uh, Daredevil number 81. And uh, we, we, do, uh, we do, there is a backup story in this. So our lead story is, And Death is a Woman Called Widow, written by Jerry Conway, who's one of the great comic book writers. And uh, with art by uh, Gene Colan, who is the definitive Daredevil artist, and uh, as inked by Jack Abel, who also had a very long and storied career in comics. Right. So, so uh, this kind of picks off uh, as a right. We're in in a like mid arc of yeah. something. Um, um, but he he's just gotten done. Fighting owl, the owl, yeah, you know, uh, but it didn't go well for him, and he's falling into the ocean, and he's sinking, and, right? Uh, and actually, this issue is not so much about Daredevil. No, it really focuses more on the Black Widow. Mm -hmm. But uh, go ahead. So he's sinking, and it, it 
it's kind of a cool kind of flashback kind of story. Yeah. So they're going by the seconds he's underwater. Right. Um, so second one, this is what he's thinking. He's thinking about Karen Page. And he's kind of um, it's kind of playing back of also what's happened previously, yeah, yeah. which is a typical of Marvel comics, okay? Right. Because their whole policy would be like, okay, uh, if every com any any comic could be somebody's first, right? So, and not everybody gets every issue. So if you kind of backtrack a little bit uh, in the first few pages of what happened before, mm -hmm. recap, uh, it makes it a little more gooder, you know, for. You know, I mean, not using good language, but you know what I'm talking about. Right. Uh, and so it, it... It's easier for a new reader to get in. Yes. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, especially in the way this show is done, a lot of random issues. It's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so it's counting one, two, three, the seconds he's thinking about Karen Page. Uh, but it flips over at the same time. This is what the owl is doing. Right. Uh, and this is what um, I think... They go into uh, the Black Widow. So at the same time uh, that the owl is doing this and uh, Daredevil is sinking. So there are several plot lines going on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here comes Black Widow. Yeah. And she runs and she's like, I hope I'm not too late. Right. Dives in. I've been too late so many times. Right. Uh, so many people I've cared about have died. Right. Do I even care about this guy? If I care about him, will he die? Like... Right. All these, like, right. rough feelings Yeah. And while she's diving and, and trying to save him. Right. And now this is, like, the beginning or, like, the forming of their partnership. Right. Because they would even book it, the uh, build the book as Daredevil and Black Widow mm -hmm. for a time. Um, I think this is transitioning to Steve Gerber would take over the book after Jerry Conway. And I think it's like they go to San Francisco and then their adventures are there. Right. As a duo. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, the Owl, who is one of Daredevil's classic villains, has been hired by the mysterious Mr. Klein, who is right. like a cyborg or a robot or something. Something like that, yeah. And uh, I've also read that he's also get causing a lot of problems for Iron Man at the same time. Oh, okay. And I have read some of those issues, too. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, Black Widow saves him, uh, and the Owl... Um, Thinks he's dead. So the so, owl is kind of a kind of a mob boss, kind of a crime boss. Right. But also he's got this formula that he <coughs> devised that allows him to kind of fly, sort of. Sort of. Sort of float fly. Yeah. And sometimes, although not in this story, he would employ a steel claw. Ah. Which is pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Um so Man, he is a D bag. The he's the a, owl thinks he yeah. uh the devil is dead. Yeah. So does Karen Page at right. this point, and so she's fainted. She's, she's watched all this unfold right. on television. Oh, yeah. Uh, she thinks he's died. She passes out uh, and is carted off. Right. Um, There's another love interest for Karen. It's a real transition right. because Karen is like the love of, of Matt Murdock's life, but they're kind of growing apart, and then I think Karen would fade out of the picture for a while. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she... I could be mistaken, but I don't think she surfaces again until um, Born Again in the 80s, which oh, is wow. a really hard-hitting series. Yeah. You know, she fell on serious hard times. I will just say that uh, for anyone who hasn't read that. So. Right. So she's being comforted. Uh, and um, Daredevil shows up uh, at Foggy's office. Right. Uh, and he's like, I don't need help. I just need to rest. But he needs help because he... Yeah. Just almost drowned. Right. Um, and Foggy does... I mean, it's years before Foggy would know that Matt is Daredevil. So. Right. Uh, let's see. And so... Um, I think Karen knows at this point. Okay. I think. Uh, I mean, why would she faint if she saw Daredevil? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It gets complicated. So. Yeah. Uh, and so... Mr. Klein thinks the owl failed. And so the owl... Because he like, did. Right. Uh... Because he didn't want Daredevil to be dead. Right. Uh, and so the owl's like, I, take, I have creative license. I do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, and so he goes and he goes to rob the treasury of the city. Okay. Because uh, he's a super villain. Yeah. Uh, he's thwarted by uh, the, Darede uh, the Daredevil. The Black Widow. Yeah. Uh, or did D fight yeah, uh, him he, too? Okay, that's Daredevil right. Daredevil comes first. And then Black Widow's like, uh, 
I'm here. I'll help you out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but this all seems kind of like Mr. Klein's plan. Is yeah. to get uh, Daredevil and Black Widow together and doing things. But does he, or does he want to get them together so he can kill them both? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. It's uh, another possibility. Right. I haven't read the entirety of this arc, so... Right. Yeah. Um, um, it was... This was fun. Uh, Daredevil almost dying. This goes on for... Your hero almost dying is always great. Well, yeah, and that's that's Marvel Comics, baby. Yeah. You know? Uh, and so it leaves off with Mr. Klein, robot guy, summoning the help of others. Okay, and so, yeah, but this still goes on for a while. Uh, and uh, I've read another part of this arc, uh, and yeah, so. Mm -hmm. But, so we have a backup story, and it is a reprint, mm -hmm. but it is kind of interesting to talk about. The backup story is The Sinister Space Trap from Strange Tales, number 132. It's written by Larry Ivey, with uh, art by Bob Powell, and inked by Mike Esposito. Right. Uh, so it's, it's a human torch and the yeah. thing. Story. Not um, a Fantastic Four story. Not a Fantastic Four. Although, uh, Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Girl do make cameos at right. the beginning of the story. Um, for those of you well-seasoned listeners, you will remember that I am not a fan of Fantastic Four. Uh, right. And, uh, I, <laughs> this it, is... It's never a book that I will just pick up and... Yay! Yeah. Fantastic Four. Okay. Uh, and I know you love them. I do. I realize um, that they have good... There are good periods and not so good periods. This isn't a typical Fantastic Four. It's just a backup story. Right, right. It's not like a reprint from that series, you know, the Fantastic Four. It's basically a throwaway. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about it. So, uh, I can't remember... There's a scientist and he's got a problem. Yeah. It starts with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and at one point, uh, the Human Torches decide... I'll go up into space and do your magnet thing for you. Yeah. Yeah, he's got some space magnet thing going on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, he's asked by the scientist. Right. And so he goes and does it. But, <laughs> uh... Oh, what's her name? Who? The Human Torch's girlfriend. His girlfriend? Oh, Dory Evans. Yes, Dory Evans. Uh, she goes to the thing and like, Hey, I don't think this is great news. Mm -hmm. Do something about it, and she's like, "Okay, yeah, smash, smash, smash. Let's go do what we gotta do." Um, <laughs> uh, but he's late, and he's captured uh, in a magnetic claw thing by a bad guy with a monocle, yeah, and a beard. So you yeah. know he's evil. Yeah, does well, he have a monocle, right? Yeah, monocle yeah. and a uh, mustache and the goatee. Soul yeah, pad. yeah. yeah. Anyone with a soul patch is a bad guy. Here's the thing. He's got a soul patch and a monocle. Is he Baron Beatnik? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, no, that's so not a real super villain. He's, should be. It should yeah, be. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, he's... The called, hipster. Uh, <laughs> and Baron <Bob. laughs> Um, The thing is caught in a metal plant thing. Yeah. And he has to save the human torch... Yeah. And it works out in the end. Yeah, this is a terrible story. <laughs> I don't I don't want to talk about it that much either. It's crap. Uh, I mean There are good comics. Lots of comics are good. These are not. These are not. Those are bad. And so the thing gets out of the magnet plant uh huh. Uh, and starts smashing the lab of, of the, the scientist. scientist guy. Uh and uh, the Human Torch is free-falling in a space capsule yeah. that's falling apart. But it's not so terrible. He's able to get away, basically. Because he can flame on. As soon as he gets into the atmosphere where he's gonna, where it's going to start to burn up, there's right. enough oxygen for him to flame on and get away. Yeah. So it's like, And so whatever. that's what happens. And then they both attack the... Which, if you look at this uh, little panel here... Oh, yeah. He would be very dead. The guy? Um, yeah. The, the scientist. Because the human torch is flying in at him at great speeds. And the thing is tackling him from the other way. Yeah. He, I think... They try not to have superheroes just kill bad guys. Right. But I think he'd be split in half. 
Yeah, I think he would definitely be hurt. Uh, There's a scene where they're just talking about it, and the bad guy's just chilling like, yep. Yeah. Uh, right here. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, we ran into each other. And he's like, oh, my head. Yeah, so we... Yeah. And then they hug it out, and he's still... He's yeah, they, they have... The, the Ben and Johnny have some bro grabs, and then they just <laughs> yeah. kind of like, everything works out, and it's cool. Oh, but thank goodness that Reed Richards was recording everything. Not helping, what? by the way. Yeah. Uh, just recording it. Yeah, I I think, I don't understand why that the idea was, hey, let's have Human Torch solo stories, or let's have just the thing, and so it's like, right. you have a magic dynamic, mm -hmm. why would you do, like, just lame stories? It's just, just filler, and right. that's exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's our books for this week. Yeah, it was. I want to thank Spencer for coming in and uh, subbing for Jeff. No problem. And, um... Yeah, thank you for listening.